Welcome to 4 Nonprofit CRM Strategies. My name is Becky Wiegand, and again I'm your host for today's webinar here at TechSoup's headquarters in San Francisco. We'll also be joined today by David Geilhofer, who is <clears throat> the Senior Director of NetSuite.org, and he will be our presenter sharing his expertise and experience with having helped nonprofits use and develop CRMs and choose CRMs in a variety of different, different capacities. And he'll give us a little bit more detail about his experience from basically starting at community-based uh, public computing centers and creating those to working for organizations like CiviCRM and now NetSuite.org. And we'll hear from, more from him in just a couple of minutes. Um, again, my name is Becky Wiegand, and I'm an interactive events producer here at TechSoup. I've been with this organization for about six years, and prior to that had a decade of working for small nonprofits based in Washington, D.C., where I was frequently the accidental techie who had to solve tech problems without really much tech expertise. So I'm happy to be your host today, uh, having gone through the process of selecting CRMs for those organizations um, and managing data and constituent info and advocacy data and all kinds of stuff trying to figure out how to manage that. So hopefully between the two of us you'll get a, a good amount of expertise for yourself to walk away and make a good decision for your organization's needs. You'll also see on the back end assisting with the chat Ali Bezdikian who is an interactive events and video producer here at TechSoup. And she will be on hand to help grab your questions, um, and she'll also be there to help you with any audio issues if you have them. A quick look at our agenda today. I'll do a brief introduction of TechSoup in case you're not familiar with who we are. We'll have an opportunity for you to tell us a little bit about what matters most to you when it comes to CRMs and managing your constituents. We'll talk a bit about what is a CRM, and what makes it up, and how they, they can be differently packaged or how you can find them. And then David's going to talk about the four strategies, and he'll dig deep on each of those. And then we'll get a little introduction to NetSuite.org, which is one of the products that's available through TechSoup's catalog as a recent donor partner. So we want to make sure you know about the opportunities available there. And then we'll have an opportunity for fuller Q&A. And like I said, throughout the webinar we'll take questions here and there, so feel free to put them in as they come to you. So who is TechSoup? We are a 501 nonprofit, and our goal is to help nonprofits, charities, public libraries, foundations, and churches with tech products and services, and the learning resources to make informed decisions. And that would include things like today's webinar. We want to make these events available to you for free so that you can have the information you need to best serve your needs. We've been around since 1987 helping more than 200,000 charitable organizations in more than 60 countries around the world. And before I started working for TechSoup, I was a member and user of TechSoup services at all three of those small nonprofits. Um, and what, we have a variety of new things available through this organization today, including things like consulting services, Windows 8.1, and QuickBooks 2014. Those are just a few of the new things that you can find at TechSoup.org that might be of interest to your organization. And you can feel free to visit us at TechSoup.org as I mentioned. So that's enough of the commercial for TechSoup. I'm going to go ahead and move us on to the topic at hand today about CRMs. And so this next slide is a poll that we'd like you to take a moment and think about which of the following is most important or most true for your organization's needs. And we only have it able to, la to allow you to select one. And if, if one of these is not your most uh, highest priority, feel free to chat into us what is. But these are some of the, the strategies that we're going to be talking about and how selecting your CRM can really um, make a big difference depending on which of these you choose. So is it most important to you to know and be able to store who you know and know what they said and how we communicated with them? Is it most important to be able to know how your constituents interact with each other and with you? Is it most important to know which users bring the most value, whether that be in um, <clears throat> connection strategically, or whether that's in monetary value, donations? Um, or is it most in important to you to have a flexible CRM infrastructure that can change with your needs over time 
and that might need to be able to do all of these things at different times. So select which one is most important. And if, if there's something else you want to let us know, feel free to chat that into us so we can consider that too. I'm going to give you a few more seconds to participate in the poll by clicking on your screen. And this will help inform us live during this webinar so we know what our audience is most valuing in uh, the needs of a CRM. And then David is going to go ahead and take over to give us more background on what CRM is and what those strategies are that you can move forward with. So I'm going to close this in just a few seconds. Peggy comments that they need another a donor management system, which I guess could somewhat be knowing which users bring the most value and being able to track sort of their value and contributions. Sarah comments, it's also important to be able to run analytical reports that show the effectiveness of our outreach, outreach methods. So yeah, that's so being able to measure your own effectiveness and running reports and extracting reports. Great. So I'm going to go ahead and show the results, and you should be seeing some of this. But about 40% of our participants have said that knowing who we know and what we said to them is, is really important, and followed closely by having that flexible infrastructure to change with your needs. Uh, we also have a few other comments coming in saying, my needs are a combination of the first and third options. So yeah, we limited it to one, one choice here just because we wanted to see what really was the most important. But we understand that a lot of these uh, may, you may have multiple needs. We also have Andrea commenting that we need something that handles ticketing and fundraising as well, a true 360. And Eric comments, we have multiple databases, accounting, warehouse, volunteer. We're looking one for one ring to rule them all. Wouldn't we all like that, huh? One, one ring to rule all of them. So I'm going to go ahead and invite our presenter who can help us figure out, is there one ring to rule them all? David, welcome to the program. We're so glad to have you join us. Thank you very much, Becky. Um, and thanks everybody for, for joining me today. And uh, yeah, everybody wants one ring to rule them all, but, but that was a work of fiction, unfortunately. Oh, so sad. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and just put it on your opening slide. And feel free to give us a little bit more of your background as well and your experience, um, kind of where you come from in, in this conversation. Perfect. Um, so uh, my name is David Guyohufa. I run Corporate Citizenship for NetSuite. NetSuite is a big software company, and, and, and you know, quite frankly we're, we're trying to build the one ring that rules them all. Um, but the reality of, of what people do every day and how they implement software is something that I've been working with for the last 20 years um, exclusively in nonprofit technologies. And, uh, from there, one of the biggest things you learn is the technology is not the biggest driver of how these things work. It's the strategy that works. And so what I wanted to do today was really just kind of lay out four nonprofit strategies. They kind of build on one another and are related to one another, and give people the lay of the land for how to deal with CRM. So, First thing is, is to get us all on a common definition of CRM. So um, the, it, the definition that I like the best is an institutional memory about interactions with all constituents that is used to further your mission. And you see a little blue circle there and a little yeah, orange circle there. Um, CRM means different things to different people. So oftentimes in a donor database kind of context, you're worried about who are my prospects? Who are the people that I'm going to ask for money? How do I relate to them? And then you know, once they commit to giving me money, that's kind of the end of um, the, the, the cycle. Um, you'll see there that that's kind of lead and prospect. Again, most CRMs are kind of built out of the business context, so, so we use some of those terms. But qualify, meet, those are all your interactions, your tracking meetings, calls with people. 
but then there's the whole other side of, of CRM. When you think of your clients, um, you think of, of if you're an advocacy organization relating to folks, um, they, you want them to take action. You want to provide them with services. You want to do follow-ups and see what happened. And so I like this definition that kind of, of allows you to get a, a, a decision for yourself about what's the most important here, and where are your needs. Because everybody's needs are different in this space, uh, which is just a 100% truth. All right, so just wanted to give people a, a, a sign of, of, of kind of what CRMs are. The, the simplest CRM, just keep track of a list of people, would be Google Contacts. I've got my list of people. I can keep my addresses in there. Um, if you're using something like um, Google Apps, you can have a shared contact list across your organization, so there's a single version of the truth. And then you go off to the other end, and these are screenshots uh, from NetSuite. And, and with that you have lots of activities. You can record phone calls. You can record events and tasks and files and send communications out directly from the system. You have analytical capabilities. You can provide key performance indicators on what's happening. Um, you can actually import data directly from web forms into your CRM and then take action on them. You can have reminders. So there's, there's a more sophisticated view of what's happening. And usually in those sophisticated systems, you have one dashboard to tell you all the things that are going on with that donor, all the interactions across the organization, um, all the interactions with the client, you know, whatever it happens to be. So that's kind of a spectrum from simple to complex. And then you have to also ask yourself, where is my organization in the spectrum from simple to complex? And I like this little chart because it gives you a, a, a pretty nice way of kind of evaluating yourself. And so the, the, the um, bottom axis is the number of data repositories. Most organizations have you know, post-it notes and spreadsheets and databases and all kinds of different things. So if you have a lot of, of repositories, you're kind of on the left side. You know, if you've actually consolidated into the holy grail of a single place where all your information is, um, then you're kind of on the right-hand side. The other axis is the value of those interactions you have with your constituents. So you know, do you have a really regular way that you communicate with every donor or with every client? Is it highly thought out? Is there a you know, campaign calendar? Well, then you're kind of on the top end of that. If you, know, you just say, oh, well, I think it's time to send the donors a, a newsletter, and did we send one last month? I don't remember. Then you're probably on the lower end. Um, most organizations kind of move from constituent chaos to constituent centric. That's where they're trying to go. Uh, it's fairly unusual for folks to, to be kind of in, in the, the blue squares there. And so one of the ways they get on that path is by employing a strategy. So I just wanted to see if, if there were any questions about that first section that, that were in the chat. We haven't had anything come in that's specific to that, but I would welcome people to chat in which quadrant their organization might be in now. So if you have an idea of where you might fit, feel free to let us know because I think that is a really helpful quadrant to, to look at that chart. Fantastic. And, and you know, the slides will be available um, through the link so you can kind of go through. Because I'm going to move a lot of content, so I'll move fairly quickly. So, one of the things we always try to remind people with CRM is it all starts with strategy. And, and there is a, a kind of there's a reason for this. So most people say, hey, I need sorry, CRM to solve my problem. What problem does CRM solve? Well, uh, it really depends. And, and what kind of CRM, and it's a big space. And, and you know. So you have to figure out what your strategy is before you can even start talking about the technology. Um, and so the big questions you ask yourself to determine strategy are, are one is how do you work with and or serve your constituents? So, so who are my constituents? And what do I really want? What do I do with them? And what's important for me to keep track of? 
what's the most important part of your mission vis-a-vis -vis constituents? So you know, if you're an advocacy organization, getting them to call their congressman might be the most important thing you're doing. If you're serving homeless clients, getting them a bed at the right night that they need it is the most important thing you're doing. It will be unique for every organization. And then what critical organizational or business processes involve your constituents? So when you look at what people do every day, what they spend their time on, what are the really critical pieces that involve your constituents? And then there are some general problems that CRM solves. It tends to provide that institutional memory piece. It tends to start to solve the disconnected data silos, but you can have two disconnected CRM systems and still create silos. Um, and it tends to create a complete view of the constituent. But one of the things that, that can get you in trouble really quickly is starting to hear all the cool things that CRM can do. And there are endless possibilities and it can do all kinds of things. And, and quite frankly, uh, figure out your strategy first, then figure out which features are relevant to the strategy, and basically completely ignore all the other features that aren't relevant to the strategy. Because the space is so big and it's so confusing, you need something to organize yourself. So we're going to talk about four CRM strategies. Um, and, and the ones that I, I, I have laid out kind of build upon one another. And almost no organization just has one strategy. Uh, they do a little bit of, of kind of everything. Uh, for the folks on the call, you know, roughly the that dominant folks where the contacts there at the bottom, I'm just starting out, um, and the silos. I'm sorry, contacts at the top, silos at the bottom. Silos tends to be much more sophisticated organizations. So it sounds like we have on the call today both sides. But the, real, the, the problem that the contact strategy solves is, is we just need to know who we know. Right? And the classic version is, uh, I have to go over to the executive director's office and look at their post-it notes to figure out you know, who the, the important donors are this week. I have to you know, walk over to the other building to look at the client services database to see which clients were, were really important. Um, Relationships takes it another level. It's, it's trying to understand how the constituents interact with us. You know, again, in fundraising, that's going to be a lot more of um, you know, who's the program officer of this foundation that we're going to go talk to? Um, who is related to whom? Um, you know, is somebody on a congressional staff person for advocacy? The examples are, are kind of all over the place. But it's really about, I've got two constituents in my database, and I need to know how they interact with one another. The third one is, is money and revenue. And there's really two versions of this. There's, there's the donor database version of this, which is I, I just need to, to know who's going to, to generate the most revenue so I can pursue my mission. But then another version of this that's not often thought about is, is the expense side of this. So this is more of the client management side. So my constituents are receiving services from me. Which of my constituents are the most expensive or the least expensive to serve? Um, and so where is the, the most quote, bang for my buck? And then finally, you know, whether you need a, a, an infrastructure to accommodate changing needs and multiple dynamic CRM strategies, that's where you kind of get into the silo space. Um, and that is, again, more sophisticated, more effort on your part. And a lot of people will start slow and move through these phases. The other kind of common statement I wanted to, to, to make sure we were all on the same page with is what it means to implement a CRM. And the first piece of this is, is a CRM really isn't about software. It's not turning on software and putting data in. The first part is define your strategy. The second part is document and improve your process. So if your process is to walk over to your um, executive director's office and look at the post-it notes on their wall, that's probably not a process that you want to automate. Um, you probably want to improve the process. The executive director you know, puts information in one place. You put information in one place. Everybody looks in that one place to get the information. Um, and this really doesn't have a whole lot to do with software. So folks that get afraid of technology, um, these, are, these are pieces of paper that you can write down on the back of an envelope. It can be two dot points on, in an email. It doesn't have to be big, fancy documents that you paid a whole lot of money to consultants to do. But you do have to do the steps. 
The third step is then once you, you kind of know what process you're going to op, op, automate, then you want to put it in the software. And then that's the software piece. Now you've got to go actually test it. Does it work? Oh, usually it doesn't work the first time around. You revise it a couple of times until it's acceptable, and then you launch it and you have everybody use the process. So that is what implementing a CRM is, and it's very little about software. Now the folks that, that then want to know what the software piece is, that's the second piece here. So, so it's one, it's kind of identifying all the data in that example with the executive director and the post-it notes. Hey, the post-it note has the name and the address and the phone number on it. Great. So now there's, there's, there's my data that I need. Uh, where's the data today? It's spread all over the place. Get it into one location. Make sure when you put new data in, it's a standard process. Um, and then you want to configure the software to match the process that you need. Now this is a really, really important point in, in any type of software, but, but CRM especially. The more you conform to your software, the less time and money you'll spend. So a lot of people like to document their process and, and hear somebody like me say, oh, you know, don't worry about the software part of this. Um, and then they want the pro the, their software to exactly conform what they kind of created out of the blue sky. Um, that is an expensive process. It's possible to do, but it's expensive. So if you conform to the software that solves your problem, again, you know the strategy, does it solve my problem, then you're going to be much much better off in kind of just accepting it. And only you can make the, the decision about whether the customization is so valuable to you that you're willing to spend the time and effort to do it. Finally, load your data. And then, oh by the way, one of the reasons everybody uses Post-it Notes is when you stick a Post-it Note up on the wall, that's your reporting. Right? You don't have to think about how you get your data out of where you just put it. It's up there on the wall. Never forget your reporting and make sure you can get the data out from where you are. All right, if there are no other queries there, I'm going to kind of drill into some of these, these um, the detailed strategies. So the first one is contacts. Um, you know, really the story here is I'm a small organization with limited resources, um, and I just need to get organized. Um, the most common version of this is, is actually um, <laughs> a larger organization that may have tried once or twice and, and had a difficulty, um, and then they realize they need to kind of start from step one of the ladder. Um, so both the, the strategy fits in kind of both cases. The challenges that that strategy tends to address is one, you just can't find anything. Um, I, one survey a few years back uh, found that 50% of nonprofits use Post-its and Excel as their primary data, data storage, um, and, and I don't think it's changed much. If you can't make a list of constituents, if you ask yourself, who are we going to invite to the event next week, and it's four hours worth of meetings and 10 Excel sheets, um, then that's probably a problem that the contact strategy is, is aligned to. Um, and everything is out of date or wrong. You say, I got five addresses. Who knows which one is really the right one? So that, that's the contact strategy kind of in a, in a nutshell. There's a couple of things in the contact strategy that, that are really important. So there's the features of the software that are important to this, and then there's kind of the implications for implementation. So the features are the first one that is kind of key is this multi-user anytime, anywhere access. So um, you know, if 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 you are sitting in next to the executive director's office, walking into their room to look at their post-its is not that big of a deal. But if you're a multi-site agency um, across three states, you know, what are you going to do? Fly to the executive director's office to go look at the post-its on their wall? It's just impossible. So you need to have some kind of multi-user access. Um, the other piece which is available now but not necessarily required by the strategy is this anytime, anywhere access. You know, I can look at this at my desk. I can look at this at home. I can look at this as I'm walking out of a meeting with a constituent and record the fact that we just met on my mobile phone. So cloud-based modern solutions tend to start solving most of those problems without looking at it. 
The other three features are really obvious, right? I need to be able to enter my constituents. I need to be able to search them. And I need to be able to list them. Um, don't think that the obvious requirements aren't really good things to see in software. Because some systems may require entry in one way or another, search in one way or another. There might be limits in listing in one way or another. Um, you really have to see these things to, to see if they fit. Finally, the impl implementation implications of the contact strategy is nice thing is the planning and process, the amount of time you're spending thinking about this stuff, is actually minimal. Um, it's a lot of simple, you know writing uh, a lot of simple decisions. Generally these systems, you just kind of turn them on and start typing. Um, you know, it's good to have an accidental techie on staff. Accidental techies are usually that person that you say, hey, you like computers. We're going to make you responsible for all the office computers. And they're like, uh, I'm a social worker and I have a full-time job already. But those folks on your staff are helpful, but they're not necessary. And there's generally no need for paid consultants to do this. But that does have, again, good and bad sides. So if you go through this, you get the good, one source of the truth, one organizational contact list. Staff starts to get used to databases. Don't ever underestimate how many people will hold on to their Excel spreadsheets um, for years and years and years, even after you give them a database. Um, they get used to databases and potentially become ready for more later. Um, but the limitations is, uh, one of the big limitations of it is the last one there, you just can't really prepare for the future. Um, the nice thing about it though is moving up isn't really very hard because you've done the basics. Um, so I'm just going to kind of turn to the next strategy here. So David, I had one person that had commented saying that their, one of their biggest challenges with, with the contacts kind of strategy is that they find that importing contacts is just so much typing that it is in itself a really laborious process. Is there a way or are there tips or tricks on how to get contact info into a usable state without having to just type and type and type and type? Any tips on that? So there's, there's, there's a couple of things. So the two kind of features that relate to that that, that you would look for are, are, are things it usually gets called CSV upload, but it basically means you can put type everything into Excel and then just import it. Um, and that, that will definitely require at least an accidental techie on your staff who understands data to make that work smoothly. The second one is rather than, uh, than you typing it, have your constituents type it. So look for solutions, and usually this is called a web form. So you want a system that will allow you to put up a web form, have your constituent type their information, have it go directly in the database, and then basically what you end up doing is fixing all the errors your constituents put into your data. They miscapitalized their names. They did you know, whatever. That said, maintaining data requires time. There's no magic bullet. You just need time. And, and that's time that your staff is going to invest. All right, so I'm going to move on to, to relationships here. Uh, and if there are any other questions, please type them in the chat box. We, we will uh, respond to everything at least offline. Um, so the relationship strategy is really, I need to know about my constituents, their interrelationships, and their activities that drive my mission. Now, these strategies build upon one another, right? So, so you know, I might need both contacts and relationships. Usually, you you need all these things once you get to the higher levels, anyway. Um, the challenges that this strategy are, and the best example for this strategy is really the politics and advocacy space where whom you know and whom the people you know know are incredibly important to your mission. Um, so the challenges it solves are, are, are I can't take action based on the constituents' relationships. Hey, these guys are on the board of a funder. They should look at my proposal before I send it in. Um, I can't take advantage of new technology like social media. One of the things that happens in social media is it's very relationship-based. Um, so you know, can I get this constituent to send out my message because they know lots of people that I want my message to go out to? Um, I can't respond to constituents in a timely manner. So going back to kind of client service models, 
you know, you, you just you don't know who, what relationships your organization has with your constituents. So people get lost up in the shuffle. There's uh, missed follow-ups, dropped communication, that type of thing. Um, so there's a couple of features and, and implementation, uh, um, implications for this strategy. The, the features that are really important, and this is something that you actually don't see in a lot of CRM systems, is the concept of arbitrary relationships between constituents. A lot of times you'll be able to manage, you know, I'm the employee of NetSuite, or my wife Michelle is my spouse even though our last names are different. Um, but it doesn't necessarily allow you to do arbitrary relationships, which are relationships that might be important to your mission, that might be unique to your organization. Um, the other feature that's important in this space is tracking the activities and communications. right? What is the email trail that I've had with this? How many times have we called this constituent over the last 24 hours? Um, you know, how many different people in the organization talk to them about the same thing? Wow, that must have been very frustrating. I'm not going to go call them and, and talk to them about the same thing again. Um, and then specific, look for specific support for specific relationships. And events is kind of the best example. And I know in the chat screen somebody had mentioned event systems. Um, events have a very specific process. They have a very specific relationship. So you want, you want to look for specific support for those things rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, the implementation implications for this is, is suddenly the planning and process now moves up. Right? I can't write on the back of an envelope. I actually have to have a few meetings with staff. I maybe have to write a full page, a couple pages of, of business process there. Um, they always require some technical implementation, and you, you want to have staff and capacity in your organization that is technical. They can be accidental techies um, that, that kind of understands what's going on. And if your process is particularly complex, it means you're going to go to paid consultants. All right, so what do you get? From this strategy, you get that personalized constituent experience. You get a sense of intimacy with your constituents because basically if the executive director just had a phone call with somebody and now you're on the phone with them, you can say, hey, I know you talked to so-and-so last week. You know, did that, was that conversation productive or do we need to follow up on something? That creates a sense of intimacy with people that is very different from, um, I just talked to you guys last week about this exact same thing, which sets up a, a, a conflict level. Um, your broader audience can be mobilized for your mission. So you can actually look into your database and mobilize one person because you know that they have the relationships with a lot of other people, um, and, and you will get an expanded reach. Things don't through the fall, fall through the cracks because you're tracking activity. If, if I promise that my executive director is going to meet with you, I assigned a task, and I followed up with the task, and the task has a deadline. Limitations though are that, that you must have an organizational commitment to the process and the tools. Um, most of CRM strategies fall down because nobody really takes the time to figure out what the process is, and once it's written down, nobody really follows the process. And once you deploy the tool, nobody really uses the tool. Um, software can't help solve any of those problems for you. Um, can't track inter um, other implications there are, that I think are most important are if you put garbage into a database, you will get garbage out. And this goes back to the typing piece. There's going to be a lot of typing. There's going to be duplicate checking. There's going to be all these things. And you minimize the amount of time you put in there, but you plan for those. Now one of the things that, that can happen as you go through a strategy like this, if you don't have kind of the broader view, is it can create silos. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. It may make perfect sense to get that event system and have that as be a, as a new silo just because you're at the stage of, of an organization where you're just trying to use these systems effectively. So we had one question that came in, David, that was specifically referencing um, a slide a couple of slides ago, asking, can you explain arbitrary relationships between constituents a little bit more? Can you expand on kind of what sure. kind of so, relationships so they, that are arbitrary that you might want to track? Yeah, so, so basically imagine two constituents in your organization. 
board member and uh, another board member. Uh, their relationship might be they both sit on the audit committee. I, I'm just making stuff up. So it could be almost anything. And that's why it's the word we use the word arbitrary. Um, one person who's a congressperson and their staffer. If you're an advocacy organization, it's really important to know who the staffers are for the, the congressional staffers. So that's an arbitrary relationship for you is who's the congressional staff of this person. In a donor context, spouse. So you can imagine this is, this is almost anything. Just pick two constituents in your world, define the relationship, and that is an arbitrary relationship. That's helpful. So if you have chapters or affiliates and a chapter leader happens to be friends with one of your board members, then that relationship might be useful to actually know about and be able to track. Um, so that's helpful to have some clarity on that. Uh, we so, had another question so the, that the came in. Go ahead. Part of Sorry. strategy though is um, might be useful to track does not mean you should track it. Absolutely unconditionally right. part of our process, and we always track it, and it's critical to our mission, means we track it. Might means we put it on a piece of paper and ignore it until we have the basics done. Gotcha. That's good advice. Um, Julie asked one question as well, just clarifying, saying she joined a few minutes late, but what is a silo? Can you talk a little bit about what silos mean? A silo is, is often um, you, know, you have two databases, and, and so you have an events database and you have a donor database. And in the events database there's one address, and in the donor database there's another address. That's a consequence of a silo. Great, that's helpful. So I think we can move on. We have a couple of other questions, but I think they're broader, so we'll hold those for a little bit. Great. I'm going to move on here to, to kind of the money revenue strategy. This is really where your constituents are the source of your revenue, and you need to maximize revenue and or minimize costs. So you know, direct mail runs this way. Grants runs this way. Do I just scattershot LOIs or do I know that certain LOIs are going to – letters of in, in, intent that I send to foundations. Um, certain letters of intent that I send to foundations are going to be more likely to generate money for me or not. Um, membership, you know, who's most likely to renew their membership or not renew their membership. So it's really about you know, the money side. And so the challenges are there are, you know, I don't know who my best donors are. I can't really steward high touch relationships. So the classic one is a major donor um, program. And so I identify this guy is incredibly valuable to me, so I'm going to pay extra attention to him. Um, but if you can't identify that they're valuable to you, then you have to pay attention to everybody, and that doesn't really work. Um, and I can't determine the ROI of a proposed action or innovation. ROI means, means return on investment. So if I spend $5,000 on this event or $5,000 on this campaign, but it only brought in $2,000, basically I just lost three grand, right? So that had a negative ROI. Um, so the money revenue strategy kind of drives to those challenges. The features that are there is the key one is tracking transactions. So I need to track those donations. I need to track services offering. I need to track expenses. Um, you're going to need the pre-built reports. You want to look for those reports already there. You don't want somebody to say, oh yeah, you can do that. Customize it. Because unless you have the internal capacity to customize it, that may not make sense. Um, you're looking for dashboards and key performance indicators. This is, inf this is uh, features that bring data kind of to you in real time. So uh, let's say if I looked at my screen, I had a dashboard, and, and it showed me every time I got a donation over $5,000. Boop, it pops up on the screen. That's kind of a dashboard or, or a KPI concept. Um, and then flexible reporting for the end user. So a lot of times ROI is going to be very specific to your organization. So somebody in your organization needs to look at the information and be able to manipulate it to make a decision. That's flexible reporting. Generally, the planning and process um, that you have to do as an organization are medium to high. So you may be spending weeks in conference rooms and writing lots of documentation to figure these things out. Um, fundraising is the most common instance of this. So you should look at 
pre-built fundraising solutions. So you don't have to spend all that planning and process time, and you just conform to the pre-built fundraising solution. You will definitely need paid consultants, and you'll definitely need accidental techies because a lot of people think that paying a consultant will solve their problem for them. Paying the consultant gets the system up. It doesn't mean you know how to use it or you can support your organization in using it. Um, so going to the good, you know, I actually can track actual and projected ROI, which means I can now take actions that is, are the best stewards of my donor money. Um, I can deliver an optimal constituent experience. So in the relationships mode, you know, I might be really good at following up with everybody, but you know, I might be spending huge amounts following up with everybody, whereas I only should be following up with the people who need the follow-up. A lot of times when you bring in the transactional information, you can then target that, that constituent experience. These guys need a great constituent experience. These guys just need good customer service. Limitations of on in this space are, you know, again, the organizational commitment to the process and tool is huge. You will definitely need some internal data analysis and reporting capacity. Somebody needs to use the tool. If you don't train people on the tool, then you're pretty much out of luck. Um, and then the two others that we already talked about. So we had one question that was specifically related to donors, so I'm going to ask it here. And we have a couple of others that I'll hold for the, the bigger Q&A in a few minutes. So Sharon asks, I'm looking for a way to track donors and to send thank you letters to them, as well as in honor or in memory of letters to the family or of, to the person that a donation is made for. Will a CRM help her do that? Or is she yes. looking for something so different? A, a CRM will help you do that. However, this goes back to my kind of point about you, these are common fundraising processes, so you're better off looking at a donor management system. So if you're a small organization, I recommend going to the Idealware site and uh, downloading their low-cost guide to donor management uh, guide to low-cost donor management systems report. Whole big report gives you all the the, the things and tells you whether you know they can send in honor letters and things like that. And at least defines the space for you. But that's a great example of there's a process. Somebody built software to do it already. Don't take a general CRM and try to make it do that because quite frankly it might be more effort than it's worth. All right, I'm going to move on to silos, and, and then uh, we'll, we'll get to some of the bigger Q&A. So silos, the strategy here is my information about constituents is spread across systems that don't share data well, and we need a complete view of the constituent. Um, you know, basically what happens is that event system doesn't talk with your CRM, and then everybody started storing information in Outlook, and now you've got Outlook in your CRM and your event system, and who knows what the address is. Um, on, in that report I mentioned earlier, uh, over half of nonprofits manage four or more repositories of siloed data. So it's very, very common. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's a good reason. So, you know, doing consolidated data sources may actually not be financially viable, but only you can figure out what your strategy is, figure out what that process is that's critical to your mission, and then figure out if breaking down that silo really serves your mission or not. Um, and then the other kind of challenge this solves is, is, okay, I need to do an events list for the event next week. Five different staffers go to five different databases and get all their spreadsheets together, and then they put them in a, in a conference room, and they merge their spreadsheets together, and then they try to dedupe them, and da 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 and now I have the invite list for the event very error prone, very problematic. Um, if you consolidated your silos, you may be able to lower the staff time required to do that by orders of magnitude. So what are the features that you need to kind of start looking at those siloed systems? You need role-based systems. It means the executive director sees something different from the data entry clerk. Um, you uh, need a platform that supports customization and provides APIs. You need to provide segmentation. And so the, the customization APIs, I'm not even going to explain, just you know, that, that's kind of a deeper technical term. But if you, if you have these sophisticated needs, just make sure 
it's a checkbox, and then ask your accidental techie to, to dig in deeper. Um, segmentation is really the ability to say, okay, which donors from Florida gave me more than $5,000? Which constituents that we provided this service to um, had a good experience? And being able to take that big list of constituents and pull out a very small slice that meets criteria. That's segmentation. And usually you want to look for systems that are scalable from small to very, very large. Not that you necessarily need very, very large, but if they support very, very large, they probably have a lot of the features that you might need um, to, to solve the siloing problems. In implementation, you are going to spend a lot of time planning. You are going to spend a lot of time putting data from multiple places into one place, which is expensive and requires specialized help. You're going to um, have a tendency to avoid pre-built standalone solutions. So pre-built solutions, fundraising events, etc., that talk to one another, those are fine. But if they're standalone, if they create silos, you need to avoid them, which tends to mean that, that it requires a little bit more technical capacity on your side. And you're definitely going to use paid consultants, and you're definitely not going to rely exclusively on them to kind of fix the problem for you. All right. So the good, you've got this future-proof platform that's magical, and that's marketing speak, but, but it is true to a certain extent. You've got your, your 360 degree view of the constituent. You know, as long as everybody puts the right data in the system, no one, nothing falls through the cracks. That's all wonderful. Um, that level of good comes at a cost. So if you're a small organization and that contacts um, uh, goal, it, strategy is really yours, don't, don't convince yourself and get hoodwinked by all the features that you need you know, kind of to solve this silos problem. Limitations is, is what I just said. It just takes a lot of effort for an organization to actually implement. So if there are no other questions, we're going to do a, I'm going to do a very brief NetSuite.org commercial, and then we're going to go straight into the Q&A. Um, so, uh, I always warn people when they get the commercial. So what is NetSuite.org? Uh, we are the corporate citizenship uh, arm of NetSuite. We're a publicly traded software company. We're the leading provider of cloud-based financial and ERP software, basically accounting and keeping track of things that go through. Um, our founder had this vision we, when we uh, deliver software to our 20,000 customers. They generally become more profitable. They make more money. That's really awesome. What happens if we do that in a homeless shelter? The outcome is something that, that is a little bit more meaningful. So we do product donations. We have a very large pro bono program because we can give away software, but we don't really actually care about the giving away part. We care about people using it effectively. And so we need to provide volunteers um, pro bono to, to kind of help them do that doesn't mean there aren't also paid consultants in our ecosystem. And then we also have a social solutions program because we have this big platform. What it means is we need to build those solutions, events management, donor management for the nonprofit sector. Um, so you know, we're, we're in the ideal where uh, donor management systems report. We have solutions for fund accounting, donor management, grant accounting, etc. Uh, we distribute our products through TechSoup, and we have about 400 grantees that use our stuff. Um, the, the thing about our donation program is we always give a base donation that is free, no cost, forever, for a small organization to use the software. Um, that includes five licenses, the complete system, support, and training. Um, if you go beyond those five licenses, I need you know, 100 licenses, you either get a 50 or an 80% discount depending on the size of your organization. If your organization is under $5 million in revenue, you get that 80% discount. Um, so you get the products on TechSoup. This is the, our little page on TechSoup. And we have three products, and I'm just going to go through them really quickly. We have Core NetSuite. And so I'm looking at this top left-hand side there. 
there's more details about the donation section there. But it does accounting, it does fundraising, inventory, project management, e-commerce, timesheet, and expenses. It is appropriate for folks that are probably pursuing the silo strategy. It's has been successful with folks that pursue the contact strategy, but it's probably overkill for that level of strategy. So that's NetSuite, the, the product, one of the products we donate. That's the big kind of mothership. Um, the second product we donate is Tribe HR, and that's your core employee record, doing your performance uh, assessments, doing applicant tracking, having an online job board. Again, for a small agency with 10 employees, uh, it's completely free. It's free. We renew the, the donation every year, so as long as you keep using it, it's still free. Same discount structure. And then the last product that, that we donate is uh, Light CMS, which is a basic content management system uh, website and online store solution. And you can see all of that in um, our page on TechSoup. With that, back to you, Becky. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I have a quick screenshot of just one of the product pages where you can see the NetSuite CRM offer for an initial one-year subscription. And um, you see that it has a $300 admin fee, and that's paid to TechSoup. And that's part of helping us maintain our operating costs as well. But you can learn more about them, and we'll include links in that follow-up. So I'm going to go ahead and get us to questions since we have quite a few. Um, so we, have, uh, we had a bunch of questions come in earlier, and here's one from William that's kind of related to the same thing. How do you educate an executive director who just doesn't get it around the need for a CRM and then get them to actually use it? So adoption was a big issue. Do you have any suggestions on how to get your staff to get on board and buy in? So. Um, that is, that is the, the $64 million question now, isn't it? Um, so the, there's, a, there's a couple of things. If you follow the strategy process, and if you get your executive director talking about the mission, and about them thinking about what people do all day, that's the process piece. And you, you confront your executive director with the fact that the people spend 10 hours to do something that's really, really critical to the mission. But you know, technology applied to that 10 hours might make it into an hour. What could they do with the other 9 hours? And, and, and that's where you just leave, you leave that question hanging for the executive director to answer. Because then they'll start thinking, oh, wow. So my intake people might be able to do more community outreach. Maybe they'll be able to visit a site. Maybe they'll come up with all kinds of cool things that they want to do because that's what executive directors do. And so you've, you've now hooked them on the case that technology will solve this problem. Now the risk though is uh, if you really look at technology projects, uh, about 50% of them fail. And, and that's because it's very hard to get everybody to adopt the new process and to realize the promise of that converting that 10-hour task into a one-hour task. But, but you really hook senior staff on the potential and what the organization can do if they could just get out of the busy work. Great. And I think that also speaks to choosing a CRM strategy that works for you instead of necessarily going with the biggest, most bells and whistles option because I imagine those are much, much more work to actually set up and get people to use. Um, so we had a handful of questions around cloud-based or local. So is NetSuite a cloud-based tool or is it a locally installed tool? And can you speak to the security and sort of encryption of cloud-based CRMs? Sure. So NetSuite is a cloud-based tool. All of our tools are cloud-based, which all it means is you need a web browser to access it. That's all you need. No servers. No, don't need to worry about security. Don't need to know anything about that stuff. Um, for an organization like NetSuite, we spend far more than our biggest customers, which are giant corporations, could ever spend to keep their systems secure. And so even though People often think, wow, I can see the server and it's right under my executive director's desk and, and the um, door is locked at night, and that's, that's got to be secure, right? Well, 
Did you think about your Wi-Fi network? Da, 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 da. So in the modern world, for established companies that have large amounts of revenue and large amounts of customers, you're better off the security that those organizations can provide are better than the security you can provide. Does that mean there will not be a breach? No. Even you know, we just saw with Target, you know, giant corporation, huge resources couldn't keep very important stuff secure. But the likelihood of be, there being a breach with a reputable provider is much lower. So we're a cloud-based system. We, we, Client server is, is, is pretty much dead. I think you can make arguments about it, but at this point it's, it's a moot point because the world has already passed the server under the desk. That's a good point. <laughs> it does seem like everything is moving that way. Um, we have somebody asking, so what, um, can you describe in more detail why with the money or revenue strategy, why that would require a paid consultant, why somebody couldn't do that with an accidental techie or, or somebody just on staff? Sure. So um, I have, um, so I, I kind of set the, um, the most common scenarios on the slides. So I have seen all volunteer organizations with volunteer technical resources do an effective silo strategy and have it work fine. However, if you tell people that, then their eyes get bigger than their mouth, so, or the, uh, than their stomach, right? Isn't that the saying? And so they think, oh, somebody else did it. I, I'm, we must be able to do it. Well, there's a lot of, of dynamics that are internal to your organization that will determine whether you feel like you're more capable than the midpoint nonprofit or less capable than the midpoint nonprofit. So uh, my recommendations there are, are all around the fact that the paid consultant will likely keep you in the room for more hours than you will keep yourself in the room. They will likely write a longer process document than you yourself would write, and therefore are more likely to keep you on to, to kind of the minimum level of, 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 of detail required to be successful. Great. Um, one last question before we wrap up. We have a few we haven't answered, and we'll make sure to follow up <clears throat> excuse me, by email directly with you after. Um, but we had a question asking, to what extent can NetSuite be customized and extended? Um, so NetSuite is a, a – we have a full PaaS platform, and that's, uh, the, the acronym is a Platform as a Service, which means people have built extremely complex applications. Um, the heart of NetSuite is a financial transaction. So people have built warehouse management systems, manufacturing resource planning systems, very, very complex software systems on top of our platform. So we, and we are currently doing a lot of things in um, client management, outcomes management, grants management that are unique in the sector. So it is, it is extremely customizable. For the audience here that kind of reported out that, that you know, 42 people were <laughs> or 42 percent were, were focused on the contact strategy, um, you know, just pretend you didn't hear what I just said because you, you really want to focus on the basics and, and, and not worry about the customization because as you move to, to kind of more customization, it requires more capacity on your organization's part to maintain it. But it is an incredibly powerful and attractive thing if you have the internal capacity to manage it. So somebody might want to start with the contacts option and then may build on that later down the road and might be able to have the options within a CRM to expand on it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. We have a, a bunch of questions we haven't been able to get to, so we'll make sure to follow up with you after. You can also join us in our community forums where you can see this address, TechSoup.org slash community, and post your questions for our experts to answer on the, the forums. Uh, we also have other webinars coming up, including one next Thursday at the same time, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, on how to get tech donations through TechSoup, including the NetSuite offers that we discussed today. So thank you so much everybody for joining us. Thank you David for sharing your expertise on these strategies. 
I hope that people you know, are able to capture something that will help them make a good decision for their organization. And we'll share links to those reports that were mentioned in the follow-up email. I'd also like to thank Ali Bezdikian for her help on the back end in managing chat questions. And I'd like to last thank our webinar sponsor ReadyTalk for the use of their platform to provide these webinars for you on a weekly basis. You can also learn more about their donation program at TechSoup.org slash ReadyTalk. Please take a moment when the webinar has closed to complete the post-event survey. Your feedback helps us continue to improve our webinar program. Thank you so much everyone, and have a terrific day.